Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to come out uh, and be with us this evening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff Kubiak. I'm professor of practice at ASU, where I serve as the director of the Future Security Education in ASU's Future Security Initiative. The educational offerings I help guide include the MA in Global Security, which has a non-technical concentration in cybersecurity and a student launch concentration in irregular warfare. We also offer a graduate certificate in global security and competitive statecraft and are building a new portfolio of short courses in similar topics to be offered at ASU's career and professional development educational out outlet called Career Catalyst. Tonight's event is one in a series of events that we run each fall and spring semesters to highlight the thought leading security practitioner faculty that teach in our programs. Tonight's guest barely needs an introduction, but I'll provide one anyway. Uh, Peter Bergen is a journalist, producer, vice president for global studies and fellows at New America, CNN national security analyst, and most importantly for us, he is a professor of practice at ASU, where he co-directs the Future Security Initiative and teaches a course in terrorism and insurgency for our MA in global security. He is the author or editor of 10 books, three of which were New York Times bestsellers and four of which were named among the best nonfiction books of the year by the Washington Post. The books have been translated into 24 languages and documentaries based on his books have been nominated for two Emmys and one Emmy for best documentary. He has recently launched into the world of podcasts, producing a very polished and incredibly insightful series for Audible titled In the Room and, and you would do well to look it up and have a listen. Tonight, Professor Bergen has agreed to lay out his thoughts on the security challenges that will face the next U.S. Commander-in-Chief who will take office in January 2025. Peter will talk for 20 or 25 minutes or so, and then we'll, we can address any questions the audience has. Please use the Q&A function in Zoom to type your question, and I'll do my best to get them answered before our hour is up. Without further ado, Peter. Jeff, thank you very much. Um... So uh, we obviously don't know who the next commander in chief will be. Um, it seems to be a rematch between President Biden and President Trump, which is interesting. Um, a bit of a wild card, I think, may happen on Monday, which is RFK Jr. seems to be about to declare as an independent and a uh, a poll that just was released by Ipsos Reuters today shows that one in seven American voters would vote for RFK Jr. as an independent candidate, which is very interesting because uh, RFK Jr. can maybe uh, uh, RFK Jr. can erode more support from Biden as an independent candidate than he could in the Democratic Party. In the Democratic Party, in a last month in New Hampshire, amongst likely Democratic primary voters, Biden was scoring 78% and RFK Jr. was scoring 9%. Um, and so as an independent, RFK Jr. can take away votes from both Biden and Trump because he espouses, and this is, I think, relevant to our discussion today, uh, positions that are Republican in some cases, for instance, on Ukraine, he is a great skeptic of what, what the United States is doing there, even though his own son, Connor, went and fought with the Ukrainians for, for three months. Um, he is also uh, wants to have a rapprochement with Russia. He uh, is skeptical about saber rattling with China. Um, he uh, So he has a number of positions that sort of in some cases, echo Republican positions, and in some cases, uh, are more Democratic positions. Although on China, there is a tremendous amount of sort of bipartisan agreement uh, about uh, China. And I'm talking to you from Washington, D.C., which, uh, you know, great power competition is sort of the order of the day. And of course, China in the Trump national security strategy was, uh, for the first time, really, uh, called out as a matter of American national strategy as a rising power that was seeking to challenge the United States with the capacity to do it. This national security strategy was authored by then national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, who has a relationship with ASU, um, and also his deputy national security advisor, Nadia Shadlow, who's a, a Russian expert. And in that national security strategy, they call out Chinese intellectual property theft, which is conducted by allowing American China, American companies to work in China, 
uh, and basically taking their intellectual property and or uh, cyber intrusions into American institutions and companies to steal American secrets. They also call out uh, Chinese expansion of the South China Sea. Of course, there is the China crackdown on democracy in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is now really no longer anything other than just simply an appendage of China. Um, and so, you know, what's interesting is there's a lot of continuity with the Biden administration. And let's assume that either President Biden or President Trump are going to win a second term. The Biden administration has kept in place the, China, the tariffs on Chinese goods. The Biden administration is actually taking, I think, a, a stronger position on China when it comes to questions like American companies doing business in China with anything to do with artificial intelligence or quantum computing so in fact there's been a quite a quite a there hasn't been really in much daylight between the trump position and the china uh, and the biden position on china which is interesting um on russia of course you're seeing um much more of a partisan split now which didn't when on february 24th when putin invaded there was tremendous, I think, bipartisan agreement about what to do, which was, you know, arm the arm the Ukrainians, admittedly, rather slowly, uh, as it, you know, in terms of what the Ukrainians were demanding. Uh, but now we're seeing uh, a quite a partisan split. 71% uh, of Republicans don't want to send any more aid to, uh, to Ukraine, according to a CNN poll from last month. Um, uh, while 62% of Democrats do. And there don't seem to be any Republican candidates uh, other than maybe Mike Pence who are sort of enthusiastically pushing for, uh, you know, arming the Ukrainians, maybe Chris Christie. But anyway, in general, the Republican field is skeptical about the war in Ukraine, which, uh, rep you know, which is also representative of the people who are voting in the Republican primary. So the kind of, uh, and I, I'm sure the Ukrainians are looking at the 2024 clock, concerned that um, a, a Republican administration would uh, you know, have a very different view about sending money to Ukraine or a Republican-controlled Senate and House or, or any kind of combination of those three. So um, that is certainly a wild card. Uh, and then, of course, Putin himself is looking at the 2024 clock, and that uh, it raises some interesting questions about uh, misinformation. Uh, Professor Kubiak and I were just talking about uh, that issue before we started the discussion. And, you know, AI, if you think about the Internet Research Agency, which was, as we now know, controlled by the Wagner Group and Prigozhin, uh, which for a long time was secret, um, you know, the, when you think about what they were doing in 2016, they had a bunch of young Russians in their 20s uh, making these sort of handmade uh, campaigns uh, to set up these sort of pro-Black Black Lives Matters groups to set up uh, the, uh, you know, uh, pro, some pro, uh, you know, they had a they had a bunch of these sort of seemingly grassroots groups that were producing social media posts and had websites and basically with the goal of one sowing division in the United States and two not necessarily supporting Trump but certainly undercutting Hillary Clinton, which was Putin's kind of role, uh, kind of uh, uh, sort of you know Putin's approach to the election. He blamed Hillary Clinton rightly or wrongly for well I think wrongly for. He saw sort of anti-Putin protests as in some way being um, whipped up by the Obama administration, or he had a sort of animus against Hillary Clinton. Anyway, the, in, the point the point I'm trying to make here is the Internet Research Agency, which in the 2016 election and later, um, was uh, fomenting division in the United States by creating these social media posts, by creating uh, sort of fake. Uh, on the in this troll farm it, called the Internet Internet Research Agency based in Saint Petersburg, Russia. Well, now with artificial information and ChatGPT, instead of having a bunch of people who all have to be 
paid something and you know take time off and and you know sleep etc cetera, etc cetera, ai can generate just a tidal wave of misinformation directed at the united states and also done because of chat gpt in a much more um credible way so so for instance one of the internet research agencies campaigns was something to do with louisiana my wife is from Louisiana, and so I, I took an interest in this. And one of the tells that this was, you know, not really kind of a very completely well thought out campaign is that they referred to not New Orleans, but New Orlean without the S. So ChatGPT won't make those same kinds of mistakes. And so I think we're going to see a tsunami of misinformation that seem that seems quite credible written in the kind of vernacular voice of local communities of interest or local communities of geography or whatever um, coming out of Russia, maybe China, maybe Iran or other American rivals. Um, and I think that the, you know, 2024, we could have a much bigger um, kind of wave of misinformation. On the other hand, you know, we're probably much we are better defended. We, the United States are better defended against it. Certainly there's a, in the 2022 elections, I think that the, we didn't see as much as perhaps people were concerned about. Um, we have CISA, which is the Department in Homeland Security um, uh, uh, Department, which is uh, kind of you know focused on lo helping local elections. Of course, every election in this country is is a local, state, federal, uh, you know, local, state, or federal. So there's very there's a variety of different institutions that you need to kind of warn about. This and also sort of warning the public about uh, misinformation campaigns. But anyway, I, I think this this will be an issue in 2024. Um, just returning to Russia for a minute, you know, the Ukrainian offensive seemed to have stalled for a bit. Now, maybe it's picking up, but it doesn't. It's much harder to. Um, offensive operations are much harder to implement than defensive operations. The Russians obviously had a terrible beginning in in Ukraine, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, Soviet command style structure, no NCO core, um, completely overestimating their own strengths and completely underestimating their enemy's strengths, and a bunch of you know mistakes were made. Um, they seem to have learned from some of those mistakes, and the Ukrainians are having a much harder job kind of rolling the Russians back from th their positions in southern and eastern uh, Ukraine. And Obviously, that's because these positions are well defended with minefields um, and other measures. The Russians are now have a better drone program. Um, but what's interesting about the war is it's sort of a combination of World War One trench warfare, and then also with this component of twenty first techno twenty first century technology, uh, a good chunk of which is American. So Starlink uh, has basically kept Ukrainian military and Ukrainian uh, government and and also private citizens are able to communicate in a way that would not have been possible if, if Elon Musk didn't have the Starlink um, low uh, level satellites in place. Now you know we know we know from this biography by Walter Isaacson that Elon Musk didn't allow a particular part of that network to be turned on so that the um, Ukrainians could do a sea a sea drone attack uh, in the Black Sea. Um, but, you know, it is his network. It's not a government network. And it's an interesting example of, you know, the 4,000 uh, Elon Musk satellites up there and the 8,000 satellites that are up there. So he controls half of them and they're his. Um, and the fact that, um, that a, you know, an American multi-billionaire is um, in some way uh, able to call the shots in the Ukrainian war is is something uh, that is both new and old because, you know, the East India Company, which controlled India <laughs> with a relatively small number of British soldiers, um, was, of course, a private company that controlled the continent. So it's not for the first time that private interests, um, you know, have a have a role in a war that you think of as a war between states. Um, so, but one you know whether it's starlink or the you know the kind of commercially accessible drones many of which are made in china uh that the ukrainians are repurposing uh clearview ai which allows you to 
identify anybody on the battlefield based on a database of billions of people's faces. It's being deployed by the Ukrainians as a controversial American police tool that is used by some police departments, uh, but it's also used in, in by the Ukrainians to identify Russian units and soldiers. Um, and um, obviously, we've had American HIMARS missiles, which have been very effective. Um, and the war has shown um, uh, a variety of American technologies and, and weaponry working pretty well. Um, the real question, you know, because Stalin famously said that quantity has a quality of its own. And obviously, you know, Ukrainian population, 40 plus million, uh, Russian population, 150 plus million, you know, uh, Putin can't have universal conscription uh, without paying a political price, but he can certainly send uh, convicts out of his prisons, uh, people from uh, very remote parts of Russia, Tatars and others uh, who are doing a lot of the fighting, uh, so to reduce the political cost to himself. Uh, so he faces his own political dynamics about how much he wants to throw at the wall, but I to the extent that you can trust independent Russian polling in Russia right now, Putin remains popular. Certainly he has uh, created a propaganda machine that is incredibly efficient. It began during the first, uh, during the annexation of Crimea in 2014, many independent journalists were uh, removed from their jobs, their, when their websites or, or, or media platforms were shut down. And then there were in, in 2021, 2022, there's been another huge wave. And so now of firings and expulsions and people who just left. And so now the Russian media is, you know, entirely controlled by people who apparently there's a meeting in the Kremlin every Friday in which the talking points of the, of the week and the tenor of the coverage is kind of the Kremlin tells the people who work for them uh, what to say. Um, and since, uh, you know, me many older Russians and many people, Russians living in rural areas, get almost all their information from TV. Um, you know, this is pretty effective. And so for for Putin, who is a student of Russian history, he said a very interesting thing shortly after the Wagner Group attempted coup. He, he talked about 1917, which I thought was an odd kind of reference to make because of course 1917 was the Bolshevik revolution because the Romanovs had so badly screwed up World War One that they had a military mutiny on their hand sort of similar to the Wagner group uh, which then led uh, to a revolution which the Bolshevik, Bolsheviks co-opted which of course is uh, the basis of the Soviet system um, anyway you know P Putin referred to the Wagner group uh, uh, mutiny uh, it kind of in the frame of 1917, but it's a sort of dangerous parallel for him to make because it was the Romanovs' incompetent leadership of World War I that led to the 1917 revolution. And of course, it was his incompetent war in Ukraine that led to this mutiny, which didn't lead to a revolution, but certainly showed that he had vulnerabilities. And he's Gorbachev, uh, he also, he didn't go to Gorbachev's funeral, which is very interesting, Putin. Uh, because And he knows very well that Gorbachev's decision to pull out of Afghanistan in 1989 was the beginning of the end for the Soviet Union. Obviously, the Soviet Union had many internal problems. But what it said to the people, the people of Eastern Europe is if a lightly, lightly armed guerrilla force in Afghanistan, which was actually on the borders of the Soviet Union, couldn't be defeated by the Soviet military machine, what did it say about their ability to control Eastern Europe? And I, I think you can draw a direct line from... February 15th, 1989, when uh, the, the top Russian general crossed the bridge back into uh, Soviet territory from Afghanistan to the Eastern European revolutions that eventually led also to the Ru Russian uh, deposition of the Soviet system, which of course was the mo when, when the Berlin Wolf War fell at the end of 1989 and uh, Vladimir Putin was a Russian lieutenant colonel in the KGB based in Dresden, and this was the single most sort of uh, searing moment of his life. And he, his whole purpose in life is to get back Russian glory, not just Soviet glory, but Russian glory. He, you know, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great. That's the frame he sees himself in. Um, 
but he, he also knows that if you don't succeed in, in war, you can easily be shown to the exits. The Romanovs obviously uh, were, got the wrong end of a firing squad and Gorbachev uh, acceded, you know, basically dissolved the Soviet Union. So he's very aware of that history. So I think for him, this is pretty existential. He is not going to give up uh, for any uh, you know, reason. He's threatened the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Um, and on the other hand, it's pretty existential for Zelensky. Um, you know, I think what are the red lines? You know, when peace, you know, there's a whole academic literature, I think, by a guy, there's somebody called Zartman, Z-A-R-T-M-A-N. Zartman is kind of the uh, academic who's done most work on when do people come to the negotiating table. And he he talks about a, a mutual recognition of a hurting stalemate as the moment when peace can maybe happen. And you, you do have something of a of a hurting stalemate right now. This is not going well for Ukraine. It's not going well for Russia. But then the question becomes, um, you know, people, you know, which side has the will to fight and, and how long can they can they resist? And the Ukrainians clearly are united. Zelensky, uh, you know, you know, in a, in a negotiation, which likely would be led by the Chinese rather than the United States, because China might would be seen as more of an honest broker, ironically, between uh, both with certainly with Russia, but also perhaps with Ukraine. Um, you know, what are the red lines? I mean, Putin's red line, I think U.S. government officials believe is his red line is Crimea, which is not entirely surprising since it was only relatively recently uh, that Crimea became part of Ukraine. It is largely Russian speaking. It's been part of Russia for centuries. Um, so uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, Zelensky's red line may be, you know, he, he wants the Donbass back, etc. And so, you know, could the question of, you know, at a, in a, during a peace negotiation, everybody has to give up something, uh, unless there's been a total victory, and it seems unlikely that the Ukrainians could inflict a total victory on Putin's Russia, or that Putin's Russia could inflict a total victory on Ukraine. So what we're looking at is a is a grinding war that goes on and on, a grinding war of attrition. And at what point does do uh, either you know one one or both sides sort of start thinking about negotiations? Uh, and the um, that part of that answer is in Putin's head, and who knows what he's thinking. And part of that answer is, is in Zelensky. And obviously, if U.S. support starts eroding in terms of uh, the money and, and weapons that are being sent, you know, that would surely be part of his calculation. Then on China, um, I mentioned a little bit about the kind of the continuity between the Biden administrations and the um, and the Trump administration on China. But what is China taking away? from the war in Ukraine. Um, I mean, there are a few things that I think that are worth underlying. So one, President Xi has told the People's Liberation Army that they need to be ready to take Taiwan by 2027. We've had a four-star American general write in a note to his um, command that uh, they should be ready for a war in 2025. Now, you know, the war may never come, but if it does, um, I think if I was a Chinese policymaker, there are a few things I'd be uh, thinking about. One, of course, wars don't go, as Machiavelli pointed out, wars begin when you please, but they don't end when you please. And, um, you know, there's the great uh, line from Mike Tyson, which is everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, which is, a, you know, I think uh, is that's uh, the, the epigraph of um, Sir Lawrence Friedman's great book, book on strategy. So, Obviously, there's friction in war, there's the fog of war, and things can go wrong. So that would be you know, one thing the Chinese might take away from the war in Taiwan. Now, Russia was invading a neighboring country over a land, a contiguous, very lengthy land border, and has had significant problems. The Chinese would be uh, land, mounting a maritime invasion over 100 miles of water, which is probably one of the most difficult things you can do. On the other hand, they have vast manpower and uh, the Taiwanese, uh, you know, um, the Taiwanese, Taiwanese don't. The other lesson that I would be thinking about if I was the Chinese is 
look how long it took for the United States and its allies to get its together, get its act together on the question of what should we do about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It took weeks and months for Washington and NATO and Brussels and London and every other NATO capital to kind of have begin to produce a kind of common response, a common military response. So if I'm a Chinese policymaker, I'm thinking to myself, well, all we need to do is get inside the, Ch the American decision-making cycle and just look at the kind of chaotic decision-making uh, process the Americans have um, right now. And we, you know, if we can have a fait accompli, if it takes us a few days, um, you know, it, then we just, we, we just, we're the facts on the ground and it would be very hard for the Americans to dislodge us, even if they come to the aid of the Taiwanese, which of course is an interesting question because most Americans don't even kind of have a real sense of where Taiwan is. And if there was really a, a shooting war, you know, I think there would be a our, our policy of strategic ambiguity, which is we won't say what we'll really do if we if there is a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. You know, I think President Biden has said, yes, we'd respond. Another president may say, hey, Taiwan's is a country, you know, as Neville Cham Chamberlain said about Czechoslovakia, it's a country that's a long way away and we don't really know it's not really our problem so we don't know we also don't know what the u.s response would really be obviously paycom and um you know i mean there's been a huge amount of u.s military planning about what what should happen but there's also the politics and who's the commander in chief and and then i think i also wanted to mention that the chinese themselves have uh, other problems one of which is the chinese have not fought a major land war um, of any length since the end of the Korean War, which was 70 years ago this July. Um, and while they also they did fight a, a somewhat brief but intense incursion into Vietnam in 1979, but I and they've also fought skirmishes with the Indians, for instance, in 1962 on the Indian Chinese border. But leaving those questions aside, they are surely aware that they haven't fought a big war for a long time and even if you do very sort of uh real exercises they have not uh you know that doesn't it's not actual warfare and and the other thing that you know they they also don't really have a a, a, a an nco structure in the same way the united states does which turned out to be a big problem for the russians in ukraine because they don't have an nco structure uh which made them uh very inflexible and uh, incapable of anything other than sort of top-down orders, which is why you saw so many generals getting killed at the front line, particularly at the beginning of the war in, in Ukraine, Russian generals. So, and then the Chinese have a raft of other problems, and you could make the argument that the raft of other problems either helps them or hurts them. So the problems they have clearly are a massive economic problem, Part much of it is self-inflicted because of zero COVID, They've lifted the zero COVID policies. There was a brief uptick in their economy, but they still have systematic problems, which are based on two big things. One, they still have a command economy, and that um, has never been typically that successful in the long run in terms of creating innovation, et cetera. Um, and then they also have a massive real estate problem. The world's largest real estate company is Evergrande, which has gone into bankruptcy it's got $320 billion in liabilities, according to the Financial Times. The second biggest Chinese uh, real estate comp company is Country Garden. That is in deep, deep pro pro problems. And the reason this is a big deal for the Chinese economy is it's highly, highly uh, dependent on real estate. Uh, over 25% of, of Chinese GDP is all wrapped up in, and, uh, and the economy is wrapped up in, in real estate, which is so it's a massive exposure to them. Then they also have a huge youth unemployment problem. Uh, the, the last figures that they published, and interestingly, they're never going to publish figures, or they say they're not going to publish figures again because it's so embarrassing. The youth unemployment uh, rate is 21%. Then they also have a demographic problem. The one-child policy uh, created what it was supposed to create, which was fewer kids. 
and Chinese fertility rate is now at the lowest rate, so 1.09, so well below the replacement rate. And um, that they're falling off a demographic cliff, which means that they will have a bunch of much older people being supported by a bunch of much younger people, by, by, by a much smaller bunch of younger people. And so you take that all together, um, they have major demographic problems, they have major economic problems, they have, uh, and then also, you know, the Belt and Road hasn't, you know, yes, they've extended their influence in countries around the world, but the loans are very usurious. You've seen, for instance, in Pakistan, attacks on Chinese workers, mur the murders of Chinese workers, because while China and Pakistan have this alliance, and China has pumped over $60 billion in the Pakistani economy, but it's all in the form of loans. Uh, and so, you know, the Chinese are not particularly popular, uh, often in the places where they're doing Belt and Road, they tend to only employ Chinese workers. I saw that myself in Afghanistan, I was always puzzled why Chinese roads were only being built by Chinese laborers when uh, Afghanistan has a massive unemployment problem. And building, you know, road building is something that any Afghan laborer could do. Uh, and so you're seeing in Pew polling recently, uh, lowest levels of favorability for the Chinese. There, there it's at historic low levels in countries that Pew polling has, 19 countries that Pew polling looked at about a year ago. China's favorable views of the Chinese are, 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 are going down. And so, you know, does that make China more dangerous or less dangerous? The fact that it's actually not a rising China, but a declining China now uh, is a problem. And we used to be, United States policymakers used to be concerned that China would overtake the United States in so many different ways, not least it would become the world's biggest economy. Well, right now, the U.S. economy is doing pretty well. A lot of Americans don't feel that the economy is doing well because there's a lot of uncertainty, but, you know, U.S. unemployment is at record low levels for the last, I think, five and a plus, five plus decades. Uh, until very recently, the US stock market was doing very well. Uh, the US dollar is, you know, absolutely uh, still the currency of uh, of choice. If you look at um, the exchange rate with the euro, it's almost at parity. If you look at exchange rate with the pound, it's 1.2 uh, to the dollar, sorry, uh, sorry, it's one pound and, and to and a dollar 20 to the pound, it used to be uh, $2 the pound. So, I mean, the pound is not doing well for a bunch of reasons, including getting out of the EU. But the point is, is that the dollar is doing well, the US economy is doing well. AI didn't, wasn't, wasn't generated to, in, in uh, you know, chat GPT didn't originate in, in China, which is not to say that they don't have AI capabilities. Uh, but uh, the fact is, is that the US economy is, is 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 doing pretty well anyway so the question then becomes with the china the, with the fact that the chinese you know she is now his third term he's getting older he certainly seems to be pretty obsessed by taiwan Did, would he see it as part of his legacy he's now you know the, the chinese system has become ironically a much less consensus-based system uh just as the russian system is actually much less consensus-based it's basically you know this is sort of more stalinist or maoist uh, there was a period in the Chinese system where you had term limits if you were a president, um, and that has gone away with Xi, and he's kind of purged. Look, he just got rid of his defense minister, he got rid of his foreign minister. These were both people he brought in, uh, but uh, he got rid of them, not completely clear why, but the point is, is that he is completely in charge, and it's his, it's his, you know, his decision to make. And if he sees that, uh, you know, the country has economic problems, that he, there, there are demographic problems, you know, and that he wants to build on his legacy. Will he make the choice to try and really kind of invade Taiwan? And we just don't know. But th that's the kind of uh, thinking that, may, you know, is going along around in his head. Um, I've spoken about Russia and China. Um, there are other things we could, we could talk about, Iran, Afghanistan, the Middle East generally, uh, but I don't want to take up too many, uh, too much time from your potential questions. Uh, I did want to end on a couple of other quick things. One, and I've referenced this already, the, the, the capacity of AI to generate vast amounts of misinformation, particularly in 2024. And if 2024, more people are going to vote than at any time in, in human history. Um, the United States has this election. India has this election in which Modi will likely win again. 
uh, which is interesting because he is really promoting a Hindu nationalist India uh, to the extent that he's basically dismantling the sort of Gandhi's vision of a more secular in well not secular India but in India where it was multicultural you know that is really kind of going under Modi and Modi is also uh, really kind of squeezing the space in which non-governmental organizations are able to operate independent media is you know being really um kind of increasingly uh crushed and there's a great deal of kind of pro bjp misinformation etc on uh, that the bjp is producing there's a very good uh, washington post series right now about this um so we're going to have the biggest more people are going to vote in the in there's also the Indi- Indonesian election. So these are the world's three biggest democracies are all holding elections like next year. So the, the capability of AI generated misinformation in all those elections is, is very high. Uh, another issue, of course, is climate change, which um, you know continues to be uh, an issue. I think it's an issue for the US military. You look at Norfolk, Virginia, which is one of the two key US and naval bases. Uh, climate change is really going to change uh, Norfolk, Virginia. It's going to change Virginia Beach, which, of course, is the home of the U.S. Navy SEALs, one of the homes of the U.S. Navy SEALs. So climate change is going to have effects on the U.S. military just from a kind of operational point of view, but then also uh, from a conflict point of view, whether it's uh, Russia, China and the United States and Canada competing more in the Arctic as the Arctic uh, uh, becomes uh, a potential uh, arena of great power competition it's you know i think it, it's a little overblown right now that issue i think because it's very hard to operate in the arctic it's very cold so simply surviving there is an issue uh, however uh, clearly uh, if there is more of a northwest passage if there are minerals rare earths etc uh, this will be an arena potentially for great power competition that uh, climate change will enable and then of course you have this i think absolutely existential question for countries in the middle east think about iraq a place like baghdad where the average temperature in the summer is often 50 degrees centigrade or 120 degrees fahrenheit you're going to have massive or you're already seeing it massive millions of people moving from rural areas into cities like baghdad because they cannot feed themselves uh this is going to lead to conflicts internally in iraq um and iraq is of course not just the only country that's going to suffer from this uh, there's been an argument that the Syrian uh, civil war was precipitated by fa- by famine conditions in Syria caused by f- climate change in 2011. Um, anyway, climate change will certainly precipitate more people on the move, whether it's from Somalia into Kenya, uh, whether it's Su- Sudanese, whether people, you know, a, a lot of movement in Africa, in the Middle East, and that is going to create um, millions of climate refugees who are going to create conflicts and unexpected kind of conditions in other countries or even with their in their own country um and then and then of course pandemics we saw how what a pandemic could do in the united states um the the united states response to that was mismanaged i think is a kind of polite way of putting it because for a whole variety of reasons uh, that include that we don't have a you know the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is misnamed. It's not. It's really like a research university. It's not a. It's not a federal public health agency in the way that we that it that its name might indicate. And so there wasn't a, an effective federal response. Uh, it was left to the states by the Trump administration. There was a patchwork of responses. Uh, some are more coherent than others. Uh, and you know the United States did worse than all, you know any uh, most advanced Western countries did much better. And we, uh, the COVID crisis group, which was led by Phil Zelico, who ran the 9/11 Commission, concluded uh, with, and it had 34 nonpartisan uh, public health experts, and it's the nearest thing to a 9/11 Commission. On interestingly, our, our politics are so dysfunctional that we couldn't have a COVID Commission in this country. There was a bill on the House floor. Uh, It never made it to the Senate. Um, Here is a 
you know, a, a major national security issue. More Americans have died of COVID than died in every American war since the American Revolution, at least 1.1 1. 1, 1 million Americans. And yet we couldn't have a national COVID commission as we did with the 9-11 attacks. Anyway, so th but the, the point is, is that our response was, you know, mismanaged and some things went right, some things went wrong. Um, and uh, I would really recommend the COVID crisis group uh, report to delve into what went right and what went wrong. Um, but the point is we're, we're still not, one of its conclusions is we're not that prepared for the next pandemic, uh, bizarrely, even though we've already just lived through one. Um, and and finally, um, you know, there's the question of our own lack of internal cohesion, which, you know, I think has been, which is real. There's a great deal of po polarization in American politics, but I do want to, you know, we did have an American civil war in which 600,000 plus Americans died. So it's not the first time where there's been real disagreements. And in the 1960s and 1970s, there was both a great deal of civil unrest, but also a great deal of terrorism. People tend to think about terrorism in the frame of 9-11, but, you know, the, the Weather Underground, the Black Panthers, Puerto Rican nationalists, um, there was a lot of political violence in, in during that time period. Uh, so, you know, political violence is part of the American story. Um, and the fact that we are seeing increased right wing violence is, you know, you know, that's also part of the American story. Um, you know, the 1995 Oklahoma City bombings were the most lethal terrorist attack in American histories. Uh, before 9-11, 168 Americans were killed, including kids at a child care center in the federal building in Oklahoma City. Um, and so that's always, be, always been part of the American story. And the fact that we have, you know, rising political violence from the right, we have still have some jihadist terrorism, uh, although it's sort of subsided because the uh, destruction of the ISIS caliphate in Iraq uh, took the shine off the ISIS kind of brand. And so fewer Americans uh, started self-identifying with ISIS once the geographical caliphate was uh, <clears throat> destroyed. And there's been a, you know, an uptick in other forms of political violence, as so-called incel ideological violence, uh, in which misogynist terrorists kill women for political reasons. Um, there's also been a small upsurge in black nationalist violence. And there's also uh, been some far left uh, violence. But but the main, and I, New America is also where I work. We have a very close relationship with Arizona State. Michael Crow, the president of ASU, is on our board. Amory Slaughter, who's my boss at New America, teaches at Thunderbird. Danny Rothenberg and Jeff, uh, Professor Kubiak, are, um, we work very closely together. Uh, but anyway, New America kind of tracks since 9 11 right wing violence, jihadist violence, black nationalist, incel. And I just want to give you the current figures because I think they're telling. So since 9-11, right-wing extremists have killed 133 Americans, jihadists have killed 107 Americans, ideological incel uh, terrorists have killed 17 Americans, black nationalist terrorists have killed 12, and far leftist terrorists have killed one. So that, you know, uh, and we use a very conservative methodology in the sense we, the good, the lethal attacks are a good way of measuring uh, violence in my view, because when somebody's murdered, there tends to be a lot of news coverage, reliable news coverage. There tends to be court cases that can be examined. And so I think the figures that I'm giving you are, 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 are you know, a very accurate uh, account of the scale of various kinds of political violence inside the United States, which is obviously also an American national security concern. So with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, so go ahead and feel free to use the question and answer block. There's already a couple in there from our distinguished uh, MAG students. I'll get to those in a second, but I, I'm going to, you, you, I'm going to ask the first question, actually, Peter, and, um, you're kind of touching on it towards the end that, um, in a lot of ways, American national security is always thought of as, as the, our approach to strategy has always been kind of actor centric, right? Where we're looking at the, at the, at the nefarious actors that, that generally are states, but are not always states, um, but in a lot of ways, the change in the kind of environment in which global politics takes place is fundamentally changing and creating all sorts of issues that threaten the security of the nation, um, some of which are actually environmental, like climate change, like you mentioned, and, and that's shaping uh, a lot of the threat to the security of the state of the of the United States. And then with the, the this dysfunctional information space you mentioned, cyberspace in general, um, 
uh, other other kind of structural components of the contemporary society of contemporary global politics environment uh, really make for a challenge, but they are ways to address that. Is there ever going to be a, a stomach for or a vision towards addressing some of the environmental issues? And, that, and again, I'm not just talking about climate change. I'm talking about just the environment in which global politics takes place. Is there ever going to be a stomach for addressing some of those seriously? Um, in order to mitigate some of the challenge, some of the levers that a lot of the nefarious actors tend to capitalize on. Big I mean, question. I'm I, yeah, no, I mean, I think the short answer is, you know, unlikely because it's a collective action problem and collective action is hard. But, you know, there, let me think, let's talk about some collective actions that have actually happened. That right. have actually worked. So, you know, after World War One, there was collective action on chemical weapons and the chemical weapons treaty has been abided by by and large by everybody except particular you know rogue actors like the syrians uh but you know most major states engaged in warfare have not used chemical weapons on the battlefield as a result of the chemical weapons treaty and so and then on nuclear weapons you know we've had also you know uh, <laughs> a a pretty good record uh since Hiroshima and Nagasaki of states not using nuclear weapons. And I think a lot of a lot of the context around that is once the United States lost its monopoly on nuclear weapons, the United States was prepared to have discussions about limiting their use and, and proliferation. Um, and you know, we haven't talked about Iran, but Iran clearly, um, you know, we got out of the Iran deal. The Iran the Iranians are pretty close to having multiple weapons. I mean, you know, they have enough fissile material. Weaponized, putting it on a weapon is another issue, and they may want to be low the, be below that threshold because it would be existential. I think, you know, the Israelis or and or the Americans, if they saw that they were fissile material was somehow being put on a weapon, that I think that would be very dangerous for the Iranians. But the point is, is that. Yeah, it's a big collective action problem, but the quite you know we've been we have co collectively acted, right. but on climate change, you know the collective action has been ineffective. Um, you know, and the two largest polluters are the Americans and the Chinese, right. and they're not really talking to each other except, you know, John Kerry is going over there, and you know there's some discussion, but it doesn't. Uh, so it's it's a hard one, and of course the people that have benefited most from the carbon emissions in the air or the western industrialized powers particularly the united states and the people who are most at risk are the pakistanis and the iraqis who produced almost none of the <laughs> carbon but are you know facing existential floods or existential heat so right. so I, you know i think on ai yeah. look where i would start is there is a norm against using ai in nuclear weapon decision making that i think the british the french and the americans have and why not try and build on that? Because there is a kind of, you know, you could kind of a, imagine a, kind of a club where people kind of agree to be part of the club and that they don't have AI as part of their decision-making process when it comes to the launch of nuclear weapons. I mean, admittedly, that's a rev relatively niche thing, but it's something. You know, the question of, you know, there used to be a US Air Force veteran, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, that the doctrine 10 years ago was always going to have human in the loop. When there's a kill decision, well, the Chinese have swarms of autonomous drones. They don't. Th I don't think they care about this issue. And we, the United States, there was a huge public announcement, as you know, Jeff, about we're going to have these pilotless AI, can you know, kind of directed aircraft, which they, you know, and they were very careful to say there's always, always going to be a human in the loop, right? When the kill chain, you know, when the kill decision is made, but I. I think if it came to a war and, you know, and that was a disadvantage, we would sort of say, OK, I mean, right. we're not going to lose the war because humans make slow decisions compared to machines. Right. No, and I, I mean, there's so many issues that are revolve around that. And I think a lot of them, a lot of the issues, a myriad of them with regards to technology, the environment, biosecurity, all those other all those environmental issues as well, often. Um, come to meet at the intersection of U.S. and Chinese relationships, right? Because the, because of the largest economies, uh, the most powerful militaries, blah, 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 lots of, lots of stuff occurs at that relationship. So that's why, obviously, that relationship is of the most importance to the national security strategy going forward. 
Um, and a lot of the questions in the chat obviously start with that. So um, one of the one of the questions from uh, one of our MAG students um, talks about the defense of Taiwan um, and and U.S. reliance on the microchip and or in some in some ways um, you know our reliance on rare earth minerals and those sort of things that have to do with our competition with China as well. Um, yeah. Put us at the center there. Are there is there are there things that can be done beyond the Chips Act that are going to address that you know that that probably won't play out for another decade of any real impact uh, that's well, going to. Yeah, on the rare earth issue, of course, Arizona sits on some of the most, I like some really good rare earth deposits. They also happen to sit on uh, Indian reservations. I, that is my impression. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the Chinese, you know, they have to, the the United States basically had its lunch eaten by the Chinese in Congo, which the Chinese totally control the cobalt, uh, which is very necessary for all sorts of important batteries in in electric vehicles mm -hmm. and other. Um, and we, there was an American company there. It pulled out. The Chinese treat the Congolese laborers, uh, I would say, you know, not particularly great. <laughs> um, you know, they don't. And so there is a way to begin to fix this. So if you think about uh, chi uh, child labor in clothing store, in, clo in clothing companies, you know, there was a lot of uh, pressure from American consumers, Western consumers. They didn't really want to have you know, their genes made by child laborers in Bangladesh. And so, you know, if if consumers say, you know, I don't particularly want my electric, you know, I'm supposed to be a green person, that's why I have an electric vehicle, but I don't actually want my cobalt to be made by effectively people living in, you know, the most appalling conditions in Congo, you know, so that there can be a consumer-led thing that reduces the Chinese role in this. And then also there is an American company now in California uh, so it's hard. Look, the American environmental laws and, and, and American laws around, uh, you know, uh, Indian nations, etc., make extraction for some of these minerals harder. But that, but not impossible. And you know, there's a kind of you. You could. There is a company in California that is. It's uh, MP. I think MP Mountain. Uh, they are. Um, you know, they're the company that's really producing it they got some money from the biden administration not a huge amount relative to what they need but they see as a as a possibility that they can uh really start creating these and i think there's just in general there's a realization we don't want to decouple from the chinese economy but you know the biden administration is we want to de-risk from the chinese economy so right. and we're doing more trade deals with vietnam and and other places and we're going to be less dependent on the chinese and also the chinese have made it much more inhospitable for american companies or any wet foreign company to do business there and so right. they're, you know, they're gonna they're going to contribute in you know not not because they want to but because their policies are just you know i think are going to create a, an environment that's sort of much less hospitable to a lot of businesses what so let's let's say the China and and let's say the the, the Western Pacific. Um, how well? It, one of the questions from uh, one of our senior mag students, who is a, um, a, a good friend. How well do you think the U.S. and allies are organizing to meet the challenges posed by China in the Western Pacific? You know, AUKUS, as you know, at, at ASU is in partnership with King's College London and University of New South Wales uh, in what's called the Plus Alliance, and part of a lot of our focus is on right now on AUKUS. Well, where does AUKUS go? Is it is the Quad the better answer? Where does South Korea, Japan play? Is ASEAN what's the relationship with ASEAN? Are we doing the right things, or do we have the right vision there? Or what is what, what might need to happen there? Well, I mean, I'm not. This is not really my area of expertise, but I mean, it is fascinating that the Japanese, which you know for very good reason, but didn't have a large military for a long time. Right. <laughs> right. Thank <Well>. you. <laughs> And the Germans, of course, also fit into this category. You know, I've I've changed their tune, and you know, I think the, I think you know, the trans, you know, the the the, yeah, you know, it's very interesting that it's uh, it's the was it the Trans Pacific, uh, you know, the Part, trade, yeah, TTP, yeah, yeah, TTP. So, you know, that was a a brilliant <laughs> agreement, right? To kind of really kind of exclude China from. And, you know, Hillary Clinton late in the campaign sort of turned against it. The Trump team pulled out of it within several days of taking office. And unfortunately, that was a pretty good agreement to do what we want to do, which is 
you know, kind of narrow Chinese ability to kind of dominate Asia. Right. Um, and and I think also today, if you look, I, you know, I think there's much more suspicion of China today amongst countries like Singapore, Vietnam, Australia, Japan, you know, list your country. They're all pretty concerned. And for a long time, I mean, I remember going to Singapore in shortly after 9-11, and they seem to be, you know, really straddling the US-China fence. Right now, they're quite anti-Chinese, China, not anti-Chinese. And um, yeah. you look at, I think Australia is in the same place. So, um, you know, countries are buying into the idea that the United States is uh, kind of a good place to be um, compared. The really interesting thing about China, think about who their allies are. <laughs> North Korea, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Russia, yeah. <laughs> Pakistan. I mean, these are all countries that are not doing really well. And those are the kind of close Chinese allies. So, um, you know, people still want to ally with the United States. And um, and I think that is not just because, you know, I think that it's also to do with our values as well as our interests. And that's, that's another one of the major lessons in, in Sir Lawrence Friedman's book about strategy is about allies. It's about having allies. You, that's like, that's like rule number one of a strategy, <laughs> yeah. get allies. Yeah. Uh, well, but as, I'm gonna, Churchill, as Churchill famously said, the only thing worse than having allies is not having allies. Not having allies, exactly right. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to expand a question asked by one of another one of our, our brilliant Mac students. Um, he, had, he he phrased it in terms of the fentanyl crisis and, and the cartels yeah. in Mexico, but I would actually expand it beyond that in some ways. To do we shape the immigration situation in this country as a national security problem? And there's a whole host of ways to do that for sure to to securitize that idea of the immigration problem, not just what it's doing across the southern border and, and, and the bordering states and the, the flow of drugs, fentanyl, not the least of which, which is a, a very, very clearly killing Americans. No. Um, but but additionally to, you know, to the to our ability to attract the brain power that our immigration policies in the past have allowed us to do and currently seem to be standing in the way of in some ways. So this well, I think that is a brilliant point. I mean, look, look at the country, look at a country that has really resisted immigration, Japan. Look at their demographic problem. Right. I mean, they have, and look at their economy. It's re perked up a tiny bit recently, but since 1990, more or less, it's basically been stasis. Look at China. China is also going to have a big demographic problem. And look how, but they're not going to have mass immigration into China. Right. Maybe maybe from countries like Bangladesh, which are so affected by climate change. If, if they, But they would also have to change the way they think of themselves, I think because they don't see themselves as a country that's welcome. Multicultural, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that last point is a, is a really brilliant point because, you know, why why have we succeeded? I mean, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, <laughs> you know, they weren't, they, <laughs> they came to this country as, as immigrants and, 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 you know, the list is, is yeah. linked. So I think, so, I think, do, do, can we, can we get to a point, do you think, where we can, and this is, you know, the process of securitizing, if you will, the immigration issue, do we turn this into a security issue that, that can be something we might be able to generate a bipartisan or at least a centerist kind of position on that crosses Well, up? Congress, you know, just doesn't want to take it up. And, you know, there is, you know, clearly we have a massive problem. And I, you know, I thought when Abbott and, uh, DeSantis started shipping the immigrants uh, that yeah. come, you know, to to northeastern cities, etc. Yeah, I, I thought it was brilliant politics, and and smart because why should the border states like Arizona or Texas bear all the burden in their public schools, in their hospitals? It you know this it it should be more widely yeah. shared, and also it should be a policy problem that engages people who aren't directly affected in the United States because. And, you know, suddenly Democratic governors like, you know, the Democratic governor of New York has said, right. well, we can't take any more. Yeah, and Illinois as well. Is, and Eric Adams is saying the same thing. And so, so all, and, you know, hopefully there will be some political pressure to, to actually solve the issue, whether it's in part DACA, whether it's, I mean, I thought the Biden administration did a smart thing recently, which was to allow Venezuelans on the asylum application to actually get work. Because, I mean, it doesn't make any sense for right. asylum applicants to be basically indigent. 
right. <laughs> in order to be able to work. And a lot of them want to work. And then, you know, the other thing, interesting thing is we should think about our sanctions regime on Venezuela. My wife pointed out to me that, you know, you know, there was a certain amount of, you know, there's a very aggressive U.S. sanctions regime on Venezuela, which there may be good reasons for that. But, you know, to what extent is it also contributing to this massive wave of Venezuelans coming north? And we should have, have a discussion about cost benefits. And then on fentanyl, you know, fentanyl, I think, is a massive national security issue. And it's the, the fixes are not that easy. It's a terrible pun because, um, you know, fentanyl. A few tons of fentanyl is enough to kill the entire American population. It's not like you can just close the border to fentanyl. Right. It just requires somebody to, you know, some one person with a suitcase could supply, you know, a major American city for a long time. So it's very small amounts. And, you know, we could, you know, there is a, there's maybe a deal to be done with the Mexicans. I mean, they're very concerned about semi-automatic weapons coming into their country from the United States. Mm -hmm. Uh, the you know there are these calls by Marco Rubio by Gen Governor DeSantis to send in special operations into Mexico and take out the fentanyl cartels. Mm -hmm. I think that is absolutely crazy because we're not at war with Mexico and Mexico doesn't want that to happen. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, you know it would be a it would be like going to war in, in another country without their permission, which by the way we have already done in the past. Well. <laughs> um, yeah, for instance, the drone war in Pakistan or the drone war right. in other countries, but right. it 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 I mean the 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 fentanyl issue is a very very hard one. The reason I think it's a major national security issue is it's the leading cause of death for Americans between the age, ages of eighteen to forty nine, opio opioid overdoses, and fentanyl is the main cause of those overdoses. Right. And so you know how do we how do we fix that is really 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 complicated and. I just finished watching with my wife uh, something I really recommend for everybody who might be interested, Painkiller, which is based on Patrick Redding Keefe's reporting on the Sackler family, uh, a former New America fellow, and also a book by Barry Meyer. It's a six-part series about uh, the Sacklers. And if you think about what they did, we often think about um, drugs as a demand problem in the United States, but this mm -hmm. is really actually a supply problem because a bunch of people were told this is completely harmless and no big deal. And if you map on where opioid overdose deaths happen in each county around the United States and say Western Kentucky or wherever, and then you map where the fentanyl deaths are happening, they're the same places because this demand for opioids this began with right. opioid, then graduated to heroin. Now it's fentanyl. Um, and, but it is, it's a huge issue. That series is called painkiller. Is that what you said? It's called Painkiller. It's on Netflix. Yeah, I may have looked that up. Hey, I, I promised you an hour, and we're at an hour. Okay, there are a couple cool, questions in the Q&A that we didn't get to, and I apologize to those to those uh, either alumni or students. Uh, I appreciate you participating in your questions. I tried to get to most of them if I could. But, Peter, I appreciate you very much taking the time to do this uh, and share with us. I hope that uh, um, we get to do it again. You've, you've been so gracious in the past, so uh, oh, I expect I we'll see, see you again soon. And uh, and good luck. Keep uh, keep good luck with that podcast. Uh, keep okay. Keep, thank you. Keep great. Yeah, get other good product. in the room on audible. In the room on and audible. audible. Spotify. It's, fan, it's fantastic. It's really good stuff. Download a thank whole you. bunch of episodes when you fly next time. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Thank Have you. a nice night. Thank okay, you all for you. showing up. Okay. Bye. Thank bye. you.